There are 12 bridges that cross the Willamette, and yes, that's how you pronounce it. St. John's, Fremont, Broadway, Steele, Burnside, Morrison, Hawthorne, Markham, Tilcom Crossing, Ross Island, and Selwood, which is 10 more that connect us to the state of Washington. In fact, Bridgetown is widely known as one of Portland's nicknames, because of how interconnected the city is. Without its iconic bridges, Portland wouldn't really be Portland anymore, and the city would probably also come to a quick shutdown. Portland's bridges, however, don't just contribute to the city culture of Portland itself, each and every one of them can tell us a unique story of Portland's 20th century, as well as that of the entire country. Here on Bridgetown, we will explore each of Portland's most famous bridges, going from north to south, showing off how they've been built, what they offer, what they mean to Portland, and what story they have to tell just through how they were designed and what they were intended for. Welcome to Bridgetown. The St. John's Bridge, connecting North Portland to Upper Northwest Portland, remember Portland has five quadrants, not four, is the only suspension bridge in the Willamette Valley, and it is not just a historic city monument, but even a national historic monument. Built in 1931 with Gothic-inspired towers, which are the actual namesake of the nearby Cathedral Park, as it isn't anywhere near a cathedral. At the time of its construction, six years before the Golden Gate Bridge, it was actually the longest suspension bridge west of the Mississippi River. Interestingly though, the St. John's Bridge, by being so far away from Portland's other bridges, also shows just how clustered most of them are downtown. It's actually largely due to all this that the original proposal for a bridge in this area was met with quite a bit of skepticism. Now, back a hundred years ago, neighborhoods like St. John's were actually their own towns, founded in the middle of the 19th century, long before Portland expanded to what it would become a hundred years later. What we now think of as downtown Portland was actually what Portland once was. The east side was even a separate city for a while. In 1902, the Oregon Railway and Navigation Company eyed the strategically placed St. John's and its Porson River access, and thus connected it with a major rail line to the rest of the Portland area. As the lines became electrified, they were soon also followed by streetcar systems, and there was even a line connecting Oregon and Washington. However, the history of St. John's' independence streak ended in 1915, when it was annexed by the city of Portland. At the time, the two communities were served by a ferry service carrying a thousand cars a day across the river. Imagine that! A ferry service in Portland! Construction of the bridge did finally start about a month before the Great Depression started in 1929, but this actually meant that it had provided some good work for people in the area during the Depression. After it was completed, the dedication was also intentionally postponed so it could officially be dedicated during the 23rd Annual Rose Festival, and today it carries a branch of US Route 30 across the river as it finishes its westward journey toward Astoria all the way from Philadelphia. The next bridge on our list is the Fremont Bridge, which carries I-405 back across the river to catch up with I-5, and should not be confused with the one in Seattle. It is a tiered arch bridge, which means that its main deck is supported by a single giant arch. At 382 meters, it has the longest main span of any bridge in Oregon, and at a total length of 656 meters, it is also the second largest tiered arch bridge in the world, behind the 800 meter Tsaiyemba Bridge over the Yangtze River in Chongqing, which is either very impressive or unremarkably specific, depending on how you would like to think about it. Its design was also inspired off of the original Port Man Bridge in Vancouver, British Columbia, and interestingly enough, it was also designated as a nesting spot for the Peregrine Falcon in 1995. The bridge was built in 1973 to connect the then newly built I-405 back to I-5 in the north, completing an addition to a project from Dwight Eisenhower's project to build a national system of interstate highways, inspired partially from the service in post-World War II Germany. Confusingly though, it also carries a branch of US Route 30. Unfortunately, though these highways were designed to bring the nation together, especially in a time of crisis, city planning wasn't really a profession at the time. And that's not a sarcastic remark. It literally wasn't. Which is why we have interstate highways going straight through city centers, and why many attribute Vancouver as being the only major city in North America without a city center highway. Back in the 50s and 60s, the car was asserting itself as a dominant method of transport in the United States. Why take a streetcar when you have the bonds and cheap gas to drive freely in your own car on fresh new roads connecting the suburbs to the city center? However, interstate highways take up a lot of space and give off a lot of pollution. 
and these city center highways also separated neighborhoods and sliced cities apart. It also made it easier to commute between the city center and the far-off suburbs. And city sprawl isn't particularly good for the environment. Those who live in far-off suburbs often have bigger houses and more and bigger cars, and have not much of a choice than to drive them further, and more often. Oh well, all in the sake of personal freedom, I guess. Next we have the Broadway Bridge. Not to be confused with the Broadway Bridge in Little Rock, Manhattan, Daytona Beach, Saskatoon, Greenville, Ohio, St. Peter, Minnesota, Little Falls, Minnesota, or in Kansas City. It is the first bridge we've so far covered that is a drawbridge, which is interesting considering how many of those Portland has. And this bridge is literally the sole reason why Northwest Southwest 7th Avenue is actually called Northwest Southwest Broadway, since it was now connected with North Street's Broadway, because that's apparently how street names work which you may or may not have noticed if you've been to Pioneer Square lately. The Broadway Bridge gives us a good insight into the history of the North American streetcar. While today there are two sets of tracks for the Portland streetcar, those have only existed since 2010, when they were rebuilt after 66 years of non-existence. Yes, rebuilt. In 1913, when the bridge was first built, it was built with streetcar tracks, as the streetcar was very popular at the turn of the 20th century. This was especially before the rise of the American middle class in the 40s and 50s, when American manufacturing was the most competitive in the world, since it wasn't completely destroyed in World War II. Little competition from German, Japanese, French, Chinese, or British industries, which could pay for affordable mortgages for returning veterans, contributed to what many call America's golden age. Oh, and car and roadway companies won contracts to pave roads, sell cars and sell cheap gas, and tear up many streetcar tracks nationwide. We didn't need those old things, the age of the car was starting. Of course, as many an angel we know or a resident of both Washingtons has found out, the car has a whole host of problems, notably traffic and pollution, and streetcars have been making a controversial yet nationwide comeback. Actually, more of a continental comeback because, well, Toronto. In part from the revenue that they bring to developments in the area. Ever notice how all the streetcar stations are sponsored? The Steel Bridge, opened in 1912, replacing an earlier bridge built in 1888, is a mixed traffic railway and road bridge, operated by the Union Pacific Railroad. It largely connects Lloyd District, almost to the city center, as well as being a common point of travel for four max lines. It also carries Union Pacific and Amtrak trains, and a walkway on the lower deck. The name of the bridge does stem back to its original construction, since steel wasn't exactly the most popular bridge building material at the time. When it originally opens, much like the Broadway Bridge, it was originally built with streetcar tracks, until they were abandoned in the 40s. In the 50s, the bridge served as a vital connection to 99W through Harbor Drive. No, I don't mean Harbor Boulevard, Harbor Drive. If you've never heard of it, that's because it doesn't exist anymore. Just as its construction required the tearing down of tens of houses and buildings along the riverfront, it too was paved over and forgotten. It was replaced by the Tom Nicole Waterfront Park, now connected by a walkway through the steel bridge's lower deck to the Farragut's East Bank Esplanade. This is actually widely cited as one of the first instances of highway removal projects in the United States. In the 80s, the bridge was closed for two years, while it went through a much-needed $10 million rehabilitation to catch it up with the times, at least enough to carry a new light rail line, which connect the city center, the burgeoning Lloyd District, the rest of Northeast Portland, and Gresham, later making a path of the Blue Line, opening in 1986. Another interesting thing about the steel bridge is how it deals with being a double-decker bridge, with that middle deck being so damn low. The lower deck, once again, was built for national and international trains to pass along the rail lines into northwest Portland. But the middle of the lower deck, because it's so low, can actually raise up into the air for smaller river crafts, without having to raise the whole deck. One unfortunate consequence of the low currents is making the steel bridge vulnerable to unforeseeable immense floods. This happened in 1948, and again in 1964, and yet again in 1996. And it's really important for the bridge to at least provide coherence to Dragon Boat teams. Though, I suppose the walkway is good if you're really scared of heights. The Burnside Bridge was also an early 20th century replacement for a late 19th century bridge. The Burnside Bridge was built in the Roaring Twenties to replace the Swingspan Truss Bridge, a type of bridge where the middle turns 90 degrees whenever a tall boat wants to come through. This turned out to be very slow, so the new designers opted for a double-leaf bascule bridge, a type of drawbridge. The bridge was rebuilt through a $4.5 million bond measure that also funded the Ross Island and Selwood bridges. More on that later. However, the original engineers were soon recalled, 
after it had been revealed that they had received $500,000 more than the lowest bid, inviting a new company to finish the job instead. The Birdside Bridge was also directly influenced by the City Beautiful movement of the early 20th century. This is evident in the bridge's two Italian Renaissance style towers, and fences in between those towers. The western one actually houses the controls for the bridge. The Birdside Bridge, only having to open around 40 times a month, does so with the help of two counterweights, each weighing 1900 tons, in order to raise the two huge sections of bridge. The bridge used to carry three lanes of traffic going each way, but was later upgraded to add bike lanes in each direction, and now carries only two westbound traffic lanes. The bridge is now even designated as an emergency route, as it has been reinforced in case of a strong earthquake. The Birdside Bridge's west side is also home to famous local landmarks, like the White Stag Sign, the Portland Saturday Market, the Skidmar Fountain and its Max Station. It's also not too far from the Shanghai Tunnels, showing a glimpse into some of Portland's less savory past. Oh, and there's also that place with the donuts with the lucky charms on them and whatnot. The Morrison Bridge crosses the river from Southeast Morrison Street westward to, strangely, not Southwest Morrison Street. Its eastern ends are on Southeast Morrison and Belmont Streets, while its western ends are actually on Southwest Walder and Washington Streets, the latter being a block north of the Max tracks on Southwest Morrison. I think we can establish that many streets on the east side don't always line up perfectly with their west side counterparts. The Morrison Bridge is described as having a Chicago-style double-leaf Bastille Bridge. But don't be confused, this does not mean it's a deep dish bridge. The Morrison Bridge, both because of its size and location, leading to downtown Portland and I-5, is perfect for commuters to and from the city center, and everywhere to the north. It effectively epitomizes highways inside of Portland, carrying 50,000 cars a day, and from the view of said commuters, that's almost as many as their daily maintenance projects. The original Morrison Bridge, built in 1887, was a wooden swing span bridge. As the first bridge to cross the Willamette River, it was also the longest bridge west of the Mississippi River at the time. It was originally a toll bridge, and carried horse cars, which were replaced by electrified streetcars. It became free in 1895, and was then replaced by a new bridge in 1905. The 1905 bridge, however, was not the one we know today. It was not built until 1958. Unfortunately, as car ownership skyrocketed, it became obvious that this bridge, not actually designed for cars, needed to be replaced. Finally, the current Morrison Bridge was opened in 1958 to a marching band performance from Wilson and Benson High Schools, organized by Portland Mayor Terry Shrunk, and even with fighter jets flying overhead. The Hawthorne Bridge is a vertical lift bridge similar to the Steel Bridge. In fact, it's the oldest one in the United States that is still running to this day, having opened back in 1910. The Hawthorne Bridge is a big deal in Southeast and Southwest Portland, carrying 30,000 motor vehicles every day, including hundreds of TriMet buses. Additionally, it carries thousands of bicycles and pedestrians on a 9 meter wide shared sidewalk on either side. It has also become a citywide hub for biking and transit, the two ways of commuting that Portland always likes to brag about. One major downside of it, though, is that it has a very low river clearance, meaning that it has to be raised on average 200 times every month. Now, obviously, this is pretty inconvenient considering it's one of the busiest bridges in the city. Good thing there's an app for that. The bridge was named for Hawthorne Boulevard, which itself was named after the late J.C. Hawthorne. Hawthorne was a politician in both Oregon and California in the 1850s, and is also known for having established the infamous Oregon Hospital for the Insane on the street which now bears his name, back when East Portland was its own city. It was quickly closed and replaced by the Oregon State Hospital in Salem. The latter hospital, though, was the one that served as primary filming location for the One Fool Over the Cuckoo's Nest movie. The bridge itself, though, was involved in a 2003 movie, The Hunted, featuring a scene taking place in the Max on the Hawthorne Bridge. The only problem was that the Max doesn't cross the river on the Hawthorne Bridge. It only crosses the river on the Steel Bridge and Telecom Crossing. So instead, they decorated two articulating buses to look like Max cars, and even installed fake overhead power lines, proving that it can take serious dedication to intentionally do something the hard way. The Markham Bridge is well known around the city for being rather ugly, and was built to connect I-5 on the east and west sides of the Lamont. Remember, the Fremont Bridge wouldn't be built until 1973, so this was a major piece of infrastructure. Unfortunately for those who have to live here though, that's pretty much all it was built for. Pretty much just that. It's essentially just there. In function, it's really kind of like a southern Fremont Bridge, but really only in function. People don't complain about the Fremont Bridge. Perhaps its opening day celebrations wouldn't be too surprising as well. On the 20th of February 1966, 
in place of an all-out celebration with fanfare, the parades, and the like, the Mark and Bridges barriers were simply quietly removed, with vehicle traffic being opened soon after, in obvious stark contrast to what the Morrison Bridge got. The Markham Bridge carries traffic on two decks, westbound on the bottom and eastbound on the top, reverse on the Fremont. It is a beautiful view at night, but only really for passengers as the person driving has to navigate all the turns and curves, and all the traffic. Think of it as a somewhat congested roller coaster. Additionally, there are no sidewalks, there are no bike lanes, there are no rails, there are no bus lines. It is designed entirely and only for cars. Unfortunately for those who really, really undeniably hate it, tearing it down would actually be a terrible idea, as this is the single busiest bridge in the entire state of Oregon, and one of the busiest in the Pacific Northwest. Carrying Interstate 5, one of the West Coast's major lifelines, means it has to support nearly 136,000 cars and trucks a day, as of statistics taken in 2008. This is nearly twice the ridership seen by the Lions Gate Bridge in Vancouver, and can even rival that of the Golden Gate Bridge. While this is obviously nowhere near the busiest bridge in the country, that would definitely go to the George Washington Bridge, it is pretty clear that the Markham Bridge can't really be replaced that easily. Tillicum Crossing is Portland's newest bridge, having opened in September 2015 with the Max Orge Line, and finally connecting the streetcar AB loops into actual loops around the city center. Tillicum Crossing serves the distance between the new South Waterfront District and OMSI, providing both areas with a Max station and extending the Max into inner southeast Portland. Tillicum Crossing has also been nicknamed the Bridge of the People, as it doesn't allow cars to cross. The word Tillicum was also chosen for the name of the bridge, as it comes from the indigenous Chinook Wawa language and means people or tribe, hence Bridge of the People. <music> Tillicum Crossing is the only bridge on this list where cars are completely banned, only allowing pedestrians, cyclists, the Max, the streetcar, and buses, and okay pretty much everyone else. It's essentially the exact opposite of the Markham Bridge, with beautiful nightlights to go along. Tillicum Crossing carries the Max and Streetcar across the river, which is no small thing as it allows crucial rail access across the river south of the city center. This was the infrastructure that finally made direct high-speed access from the city center to southeast Portland and Milwaukee possible. The inner southeast of Portland has recently seen a large wave of development projects and businesses popping up, with the advent of the Orange Line. Technically an extension of the Yellow Line, but still. On the west side though is the burgeoning new South Waterfront District, the Dubai of Portland as I like to call it, since it all sprang up in the last 15 years. Not very long ago, the whole area was barely more than an empty plot strangely close to the city center, and right at the foothills of the Markham Hill, where the Oregon Health and Science University, or OHSU, was located. This meant they could easily expand at the riverfront, especially with their own aerial tram for access downhill across I-5. In 2015, Tilgum Crossing and the Max Orange Line were arguably the last steps in putting this area truly on the map. The Ross Island Bridge, named after a nearby uninhabited Ross Island, has the task of carrying US Highway 26, known on the east side as Southeast Powell Boulevard, and to me whenever I ride the Green Line as, wait, I thought this was the Southeast Division. US Highway 26 goes all across the state of Oregon from the Idaho State Line, just south of where ID4 crosses the border, all the way over to Seaside where it intersects with US Route 101, serving as a common route between Portland and the Oregon coast. The entire route, though, goes all the way east to Ogallala in western Nebraska, meaning that this road is of utmost importance for the security of the nation. The Ron Steinway Bridge, while passing directly through and over South Waterfront, actually serves more inland neighborhoods, connecting with 99W, or Southwest NATO, in a bit of a weird configuration before continuing off west underneath the West Hills off to the Oregon coast. Built in 1922 with cars in mind, it only has one narrow sidewalk, situated on the northern side. It was paid for with the same $4.5 million bond measure that helped build the Burnside Bridge. Currently though, the bridge is undergoing a 3 year $30 million repainting job that started back in 2014. So any moment now? Despite the name, the Ross Island Bridge does not actually stop off in Ross Island, it just passes directly north of it. This means that Ross Island, named after Oregon pioneer Sherry Ross, and actually part of a small archipelago, can only be reached by a boat. However, those who live on Ross Island don't have to worry about this, they can simply leave and come back by flapping their wings. That's because Ross Island serves as a wildlife reserve, ever since Ross Island's Sand and Gravel Company, or RISG, donated the use of the archipelago to the city of Portland in the 2000s. Before this, the archipelago was a big hotspot for underwater dredging, 
especially after the US Army Corps of Engineers built an artificial levee there, connecting the once separate Ross and Hardtack Islands. This made an artificial lagoon that made dredging considerably easier. Of course, though the company still lives on, the dredging in the area is no more, since birds and otters aren't really that interested in underwater dredging. Our last bridge on our list is the Selwood Bridge, located at Southwest Is This Really Still Portland Street, and which recently underwent a huge rebuilding project. The original Selwood Bridge was built in 1925 by Gustav Lindenthal and replaced a much complained about ferry service, kind of like what happened up north, also hence Tierra's Ferry Road that starts nearby. The bridge was a truss bridge and was open for 91 years. However, as time wore on, several problems were noticed with the bridge, mainly the huge cracks forming at either end. With the bridge's condition having been deteriorating since the 1960s, the weight capacity of trucks had to be lowered from 32 tons to just 10 tons in 2004. It was also very narrow, even for the 20s. With incredibly narrow sidewalks, one lane of traffic either way, and not much thought for bikes. Additionally, it was not built for huge weights, and was therefore not quite as sturdy. In 2005, Multnomah County and civil engineering company Bechtel decided enough was enough, and agreed to partner up to replace the yelling bridge. After years of construction, the new bridge, built right next to the old one, opened on the 29th of February 2016, the old bridge having been closed for only four days. In the mid-20th century, especially in the 50s and 60s, America was rebuilding itself up, having won World War II without suffering any direct losses, or having any international competition in the markets, for reasons previously established, caused American infrastructure to boom. Not just interstate highways, but also suburbs, dams, bridges, airports, and pretty much everything you think of other than reliable railways were built in this massive national building spree. Of course, any structure that is built will have to be repaired if it doesn't want to end up like the old Selwood Bridge. The problem with that, of course, is the new trend in US politics of thinking of infrastructure as somehow boring, instead of a life or death issue it really is. However, replacing the Selwood Bridge, instead of just repairing the old one, actually turned out to be a great idea, as not only could the bridge be repaired for better service, but it could also be upgraded for better, higher volume traffic, including bikes. Put it this way, at least we didn't end up like Pittsburgh with their Greenfield Bridge over I-376, which has been in such deterioration that another smaller bridge was built underneath this catch falling debris. All these bridges, regardless of their type, the type of vehicles they carry, their river clearance, or their location, are absolutely crucial to our city's economy and development, but also to our city's culture. From the old to the new, the bustling highways to the suburban roads, the beautiful to the not so much, they are effectively the staples that bind your city together, both literally and metaphorically. And while there are a lot of cities with a notable amount of bridges crossing a central river, the bridges of Portland 